Hello everybody and welcome to Adobe Live. Uh, we would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we are creating and streaming from today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Flynn and I'm here with the fantastic Karen Alsop. Hi Karen, how are you doing? Oh, hi Flynn, fantastic. How are you? I'm great. It's, uh, it's great to have you back. We had a great stream on Tuesday, um, covered a lot of ground in terms of photography and today we are focusing on the editing portion of things. You've got a lot of great stuff in store for us today. I'm very excited. Yeah, it should be super. I can't wait to share. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, that's, that's the attitude and it's, and it's Thursday. One more day till the weekend. I'm pumped. <laughs> um, and welcome everybody that is watching live. If you're watching uh, this stream live, uh, you can interact with us. Feel free to ask questions as we're going along. If there's something on the top of your mind, what's that tool that you use? Do you use this? Um, I do it this way. What do you think about that? Whatever it is, um, throw it in chat. Um, any questions around editing or photography uh, while we have the fantastic Karen with us, now's your chance. Um, and if you're watching the replay, thanks very much for watching. Um, there'll be links below um, from anything we sort of chat about today as well. So if we mention something, we'll throw some links in chat. Um, but yeah, without further ado, should we get stuck into it, Karen? I think we should. We've got so much to get into today. Yeah. So yeah. why don't we start with showing people how I work? Because I think it's really interesting to kind of go behind yeah. the scenes on the setup and everything. So. I have got another camera set up so that I can show everyone what I am or how I'm working. So I'll go over to that camera. Look at that. This is great. Okay. I love this. You're making my setup feel like novice compared to everything you've got going <laughs> on over there. It's really cool. Um, yeah, there's a fair bit. There's a fair bit. So up here, there is my ASO monitor. Um, this is where I look at i it's color calibrated i have to make sure that what i see on my screen is what comes out in my print and i print i've got my own uh, epson 8070 uh, it's a 44 inch printer and so i've calibrated this monitor so what i see here is how the prints come out and it's amazing to be able to do that so highly recommend you know if you can get your monitor calibrated whatever it is um it makes life is so much better quick Over question quick question yeah, before we move on from there how do you get your monitor calibrated I, you know yeah let's say you buy a yeah. new monitor it comes out of the box what yeah. would you do if you needed to do if you wanted to do that they're all different this one actually has an indoor calibrator that pops down and um the way that you calibrate it to the paper is kind of next level and next step where you would actually do a printout of a bunch of different colors uh and colors and squares and you match that you literally hold that in front of you and you adjust it until you until it looks the same because every paper is different so i print on pencil and infinity different fine art papers mostly and there's some papers that are more warm some are cooler so you can actually calibrate different types of right um, it's actually a little bit hard to hear you at the moment. We might need to bring the mic a little bit closer. All right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I might mm -hmm. even uh, turn that up a bit. Is that better? Flint? That's great. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, so that, that is a big part of my workflow. Um, but when I'm working too, I also, so over here, if I, um, I actually turn off my little face there, this is my doesn't need to be calibrated talking monitor. This is where I'm seeing everyone and where I'm seeing you then. Uh, and so that is, I don't even bother about calibrating it, but do you know the good thing about having an uncalibrated dodgy monitor sitting here is I pull my image over to see how other people might actually view it when they're looking on their own dodgy right too so it's it's nice to have that comparison yeah that's great that's like with ui designers like often they have to have like all different models of um like old iphones and like samsung's yeah. and like you know yeah. just to see does this actually work on different tech if you know yeah you know it's always great to have the best the absolute best piece of technology but you're using like a you know 4k monitor that's beautifully color calibrated but what does it actually look like i don't know not a CRT, yeah. but you know what I mean. An old monitor um, <laughs> Absolutely. That a yeah, lot of yeah. other people might be using. Yeah, it's 
clever. Yeah, and that, and that's why I often put images on my phone or on my iPad as well because it's the same thing. You know, see yeah. how my, many people might see it. I do you have a little iPad down here? Actually, that's set up so I can show you a little bit later how I really badly sketch my work and my ideas. So that that's plugged in so that I can show you. But sometimes I use this as an extra monitor as well because you know now with the latest Max, you can actually um, just make it an extra monitor, which is really cool. Um, and I can do that wirelessly when I'm moving around the studio too. Now, down here, the microphone is in the way. I am going to move it a little. Okay. <laughs> this is the Cintiq Pro 16-inch. Um, so I use this. This is my tablet. I use this to work on. Uh, the way that I've got it set up, so you can set it up so many different ways. You can have it as an extra monitor. So I could have, you know, three or even four with the iPad different screens if I wanted to. Currently, I've got it set up so this one mirrors this one. And I can look down while I'm working and really kind of zoom up and, and work closely, or I can look up at the screen. So uh, this this works really well when you're kind of getting in and doing fine things, you can look down there. But, you know, tablet is really crucial to the kind of work that I do because trying to edit this sort of thing with a mouse would be almost impossible. So yeah. this is, yeah, this is the one that I use. And um, I, I do... I do have something else coming in. It didn't come in time. It was, it was on the way actually from Wacom. Currently I use a stream deck, which is the buttons over here. And this oh. is what I press to, to change screens when I'm streaming. Um, but the Loop Deck CT is on its way to me. And that will enable me to set buttons up for Photoshop or for um, Lightroom or whatever it is. And it has knobs and everything like that. And I can also replace the stream deck with, with that as well. So it's going to do both the live streaming and also all the control that I need for Photoshop. So you basically get rid of your keyboard unless you're you know, typing a word. So I yeah. love to work like that with everything kind of preset to exactly what I want. I've got some little buttons under here that I've programmed as well which really helps so, yeah and so for those yeah. for people that don't know like the stream deck and i'm assuming the, the wacom device as well um you can program yep. it to be so much stuff you can program it to you know cut and paste or yep. you know a shortcut or can you program a single key to do an action uh you yeah you can i haven't i haven't tried that you can, there, there's yeah, so many that. different things yeah. you can do yeah 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 you can and on the stream deck and also on the loop deck uh, you can have multiple pages as well. So like this is a little stream deck, um, but yeah, you can have multiple pages. So you can have something set up for Photoshop and then you can have something set up for Lightroom and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Cool. All right. So I'm going to switch back over to this cam. There we go. <laughs> so yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, I'm really happy to answer them. Uh, you know, you might... I guess it can look overwhelming with all the gear that I've got. You don't have to have all that gear to, to do this kind of work, but every little piece of tech kind of helps the whole process. Yeah, uh, yeah well, I, I could geek out. We could just spend an hour talking about all the tech stuff um, if it was up to <laughs> me, but um, we should jump into some of the editing stuff as well. And yes, um, as Karen, if yeah. you just mentioned, if you're just joining us, feel free to throw questions in uh, in chat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Johanna shared a link to the loop deck as well. So if anyone wants to check it out, um, check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that loop deck comes with the Cintiq up until the end of the financial year. So it's a special that that link will take you to so you can get both. So you basically get the loop deck for free. So oh, wow. yeah, check that one go. out. Cool. Yeah. Check yeah. it out. Awesome. Okay. So today we are going through this piece uh, that I'm going to bring up on here. <clears throat> So this is called Straight to the Pool Room. And I created this very recently for a client who reached out to me that wanted to have something really special of her pets. Her pets mean so much to her and um, some of them are getting on in age and they've lost a few pets along the way, obviously, as you do. And so we, need, we came up with 
first the idea to create something, but I didn't know what I was going to create for them. Mm. So I needed to go to their house. I needed to scope it out, figure out what possible options I had. Um, one of the ideas was to have the pets actually playing around in the swimming pool. So not the pool table, but the swimming swimming pool. And that was, that was an idea. Another one was to have them sitting around a table eating. Um, but when I went into their pool room, I thought this is perfect. I can create something where the animals are playing pool, they're all interacting with each other, and the actual piece, there was a perfect spot up on the wall where it could hang. So it, they've now got a 1.2 metre canvas that's going up in the pool room, straight to the pool room, as the saying is in the castle movie, if you mm. haven't seen it. <laughs> so... um. Yeah, so I'm taking you through this one uh, and to show you not, not so much the creation of it, although I will show a behind the scenes video that shows the speed edit part of that, but more so the finishing off of how I get that painterly look. You know, people always tell me, is it, or they ask, is that a painting? Uh, mm. when, I'm, when I'm in the exhibition, Puffing Billy, that I've talked about, and, and people go, oh, is that, are you the artist? And then they say, oh, is that, a, did you paint that? Did you paint that? And I'm always kind of needing to explain the process, which then makes them really interested as to how it's done. But there's certain techniques that I use to get that finished painterly look. So that, that's what I'm going to take people through today. It, this also kind of reminds me a little bit of like the dogs playing poker kind of thing. Yeah. Like it's a bit like that, um, which was a painting as well. So I can see yeah. I can see how people would see this and be like, oh, it's like a modern day take. It's like Coolidge or something. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's super, it's super cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah. It's um and and that's obviously a little bit of an inspiration there. That's a very well-known painting. Um I use Pinterest as well to pin ideas when I'm coming up with ideas and the, I like to pin illustrations rather than composites because if you try and get ideas from other people's composites, you can end up maybe copying it whereas mm. if you're um yeah, a composite artist and you're getting inspiration from illustrations and paintings, I think then you can really create it and make it your own. So that's, um, yeah, that's something that I do. Yeah, I but, think that's good advice yeah. kind of ac across the board. Like um, it's always mm. great, you know, illustrators looking at other illustrators and things like that. But if you get yeah. inspiration from outside of your field, that's usually better because even subjectively you might, you mm -hmm. know, ac yes, it might accidentally kind of, not realize where the idea came from it may have come from another artist so it's always something that we always have to keep in mind very very true yeah um so i started this with it in my head and i had had to try and find a way to get it down on paper or <laughs> digitally and i am really bad at drawing really really bad at drawing <laughs> but I, i'm going to show it to you anyway so i use uh Adobe Fresco that <laughs> so bad um, that I sketch on. So I use the little iPad. I've got my little pen and I try and sketch at least so I have an idea of what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, I try and sketch the idea. Now this, <laughs> I don't even know if people can tell what's a cat and what's a dog. What's <laughs> but that's thing. okay. So that, so that, cause this is for you, right? Like this is the whole thing about thumbnails and sketching, just getting your ideas and putting something down. Is it, is it's for you? My, you know, not that I sketch very often these days and so my sketches would be the same, like the minimum quick as possible might do a bunch of different ideas and get them quickly down. Um, but it's yeah. invaluable for getting your ideas out and having, you know, somewhere to start with and just putting, you know, digital, digital pen to paper mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, yeah. So it's great. So yeah, thanks for sharing because I, I feel good about my <laughs> sketches as well because my scrapbooks all, all looked, you know, wouldn't make any sense if I showed it to someone else. At least <laughs> at least this looks like animals and a pool table. Yeah, yeah, it, it somewhat does. <laughs> um, well, the other thing that I do love about using fresco uh, as opposed to paper, so I think sometimes my work looks a bit better when I use fresco and I use all the different brushes. This one's not great but you know, the watercolor and everything is a bit of fun but it also saves on the clouds I can save on the cloud and then I can go into Photoshop on my computer and I can see that sketch and I can use it as a reference and I don't need to like download it and upload it and, and do all of that so it is good in that way as well yeah yeah it's always great <laughs> um so 
I would like to now show the behind the scenes. Now, this, this video, I won't talk through it. I'll let it do the talking, um, but I will preface uh, the story by explaining a little bit about the animals and the order in which I needed to um, photograph them. So I'm just going to go back to the image itself. So the dog, um, a Dalmatian, beautiful old Dalmatian, 12 years old, um, this, this little, this dog had to um, come to the studio first because uh, the owner was worried that she would need to get it put down and, you know, had cancer, it was um, in pain and I rushed her to the studio, I said, let's, let's do the shoot. I, at that point, I didn't know what I was creating. So I hadn't come up with this idea yet. I hadn't even been to their house. This was just like the first thing I have to do so I can get the shots of the dog. And um, I might actually bring up the shots of the dog. So I'll do that. Uh, oh, hang on, this one. <laughs> Over here. So they're, they're even, you know, with photographing this dog, uh, it, it was so limited. Uh, most of the time, yeah. Molly, the dog's name, was panting. Um, she was not really able to kind of lie down or do anything much with with the way that she was walking around. It was just sort of a wandering, wandering through the green screen the studio area, having um, as much lighting as I could to sort of fill out the space that she'd be walking around. And... I knew I would have to do a lot of cutting. Um, normally when I photograph an animal, I try and get a lot of angles of paws and legs. And I didn't, I wasn't even able to get like the paw up just because of the situation with where the dog was at. So I had these shots to work with and I got them. And then um, sadly, four days later, I did need to have Molly put down, but I had the shots. Um, and so I then went to their house and I was then able to do a little bit of a tour in their house and sort of figure out well what can I actually photograph um the chicken I did need to shoot the chicken I just say, I shouldn't say shoot I did need to photograph the chicken <laughs> um th when I went there as well because and without knowing what I was doing exactly but this chicken was pretty depressed because she had um, been really connected to the dog. So she'd been right. pulling out her feathers and, um, yeah, sort of wandering around sadly. Cool. So I wasn't sure how the chicken would go. Thankfully, the chicken's still with us. So um, so the chicken sort of recovered. But um, but then I, I came up with this pool table idea because I'd gone through their home. I'd seen their amazing swimming pool, their amazing dining table and everything. And this pool table... And the space that I could put it in was just absolutely perfect. So that's the point that I sort of knew I now what to photograph the chicken and now where do I put the cats? So I actually photographed the cats on the billiard table to get the lighting and everything as matching. Oh, right. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was sort of the process of it. Um, so yeah, the behind the scenes will show a little bit of that, bit of behind the scenes shooting and the speed edit of me putting it together. All right, let's check it out. All right.
This is going straight to the pool room. just so beautiful just having Molly I just um, it's just beautiful I just love it absolutely love it <laughs> Cool. So That's if really anyone great. has any questions um, about any of that, because I know you, you'd see the speed edit and probably have questions about some things that I did in there if you caught them. Uh, yeah, jump in and ask away. It'd My main like question is what do you use to create the, the videos? Because it's quite, I think it's something that a lot of people don't do. Like, and mm. it's something that is really great to show, you know, create like a two to three yeah. minute kind of video about a project. Um, and you're obviously thinking about documenting it while you're going as yeah. well. So, yeah, I guess, you know, do you find that that's really valuable, like to show other clients oh, yeah. and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and what, how do you, what's your approach, I guess? Yeah. Uh, so I, I try and do it for every piece that I create. Um, mm. Some are a little more epic than others, but it's I, I try and make it as simple as possible. Like I often get... Uh, different people to come and help me. They might not have shot anything before as a video. Often it's photographers wanting to help. So I just give them the basics of how to shoot video on the on the Nikon Zs, uh, set them up with it and get them to sort of follow me around and follow the action. I often just um, have a few cameras on tripods. So if I don't have someone there helping me, I can just stick the cameras on tripods and at least capture something. Mm. Um, and yeah, and then putting it together in the speed edit. Uh, so I'll record my process i use ecamm because that's what i'm using for live streaming but it's quite a lot of different pieces of software out there that will record your editing process so that's always something that's um integral to people seeing how it comes together i had a potential client contact me the, after I posted this on um, social media and she wanted to hire me to create something similar. And mm. I don't need, I find I don't need to explain to people why I have to charge what I would charge to create something like this. Um, immediately they're like, no, we completely understand. There's so much work that goes into it. And I think really the only way to show that is to document it. Yeah. 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 That's the whole thing, right? A client can see yeah. something and say, great, I love what you did with that. We want something similar for us. And it just makes that, yeah. you know, connection between what they what they want and, you know, what you can do. And they're like, great, let's see, is she available? Let's do it. Like it makes it so That's easy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it means too that they, um, 
they give me a lot of creative freedom because they trust me because they've already seen that process. Yeah. Um, so that that's really helpful too. And I often with the editing, um, one of the I use different software to edit. I kind of jump around <laughs> into different software and try them all. But one of the ones, if you're just starting out, I highly recommend is actually Adobe Rush because it's really easy to use. Um, my son's actually using it to edit his videos for YouTube. Um, and yeah, you can throw together a behind the scenes video very, very quickly. Yeah, it's certainly very fast. So Rush in uh, by name and by nature. I suppose um, it's a clever name. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Should we should we jump into? Was it Lightroom? We're going to check out. Uh, we are going to check out Photoshop. Photoshop. Primarily, so cool. yeah, let's yep. do it. So we'll jump into that. Okay. All right. So we are in the file now. I have simplified this file down quite substantially so that I can show you those finishing off. Uh, different techniques. A lot of the time when I'm presenting, I show the how to extract, how to add shadows, all of those sort of things, which I'm not showing today. So that's um, that's something that, you know, you can definitely learn. But um, what I want to show is this difference between now, this is without all finishing actions, and that is with the things that I do at the end to finish. And I so often get people asking me, how do you create that look? Mm. And it really is a number of steps. Um, it's not always the same steps, but I think what I'll show today um, are some really good tips that can at least kind of start you in the right direction. So, Yeah, yeah. great. Now I'm going to turn this off. So we're now back to kind of the, the basically everything's cut out, everything's put in, shadows are put in. It's time to finish off the piece. And the first thing that I'm going to do is a little trick with a cloud overlay. So I use um, libraries, so Adobe libraries, and I've got things saved in my library that I've photographed that I use quite often. Uh, so I've got atmosphere overlays in here that I've photographed and changed the color of and I throw them in quite often and I've got cloud overlays. All this is, it's just clouds, you know, an overcast sky and I probably should go and take more of them because I've only got five to select from but pretty much they, they all have a different look to them. And I've made them black and white and I pull it into a, to an image once I've finished it, put it over the top um, so I'll just stretch it out a little bit so it's this is this is very Melbourne. <laughs> this so easy to get these shots in Melbourne, absolutely. Uh, so now we've got the cloud overlay, but what I then do is change the blending mode. Normally, soft light or overlay, it really depends on the image as to what works. Change it to soft light, and then pull down the opacity until it's subtle, but it's there. So if I turn that off and on, actually, oh, sorry, this one here. You can see the difference, but it's not, it's not overpowering. Now, what that actually does is it makes some bits darker and some bits lighter. And when you composite and you're bringing in so many elements together, the tricks to kind of blend are to put a few things over the top that help bring them together. And so having a, a section, if I turn that up again, Having, you know, this part a bit lighter, this bit a bit darker over the top, then sort of starts to bring it all together. So it's just one little trick that I use. And you could use um, different types of overlays and textures to also achieve that. Uh, a lot of people use textures uh, that have maybe more uh, obvious um, patterns to them and things. So that that's an option too. For my work, I tend to shy away from those kind of textures because there's so much going on. There's so mm. so much detail. So I can't put, you know, a texture over the top. But for for composites that are a little more um, straightforward, there's there's not as much detail, then other types of textures would work well. And what sort of textures do you see other people using? Like when we're talking textures, are we like is, mm. is it like wood texture or is it more like houndstooth or you know crosshatch or something like that often things like this so i with this one here i'll show you this one this i just painted a um canvas and just randomly painted a canvas so they might put something like this that has all the paint strokes on it right and it has some color to it as well and then putting that as an overlay so you can see if that was on something that was um 
wasn't as detailed, then that could work quite well, especially on a background. Um, so that's another way of doing it. But yeah, for mine, you can see it just actually takes away from that image itself. So right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so that's that's the first step. And then another thing that I do actually, noise and grain, I do right at the end. I'll do it now just because it's a step that I want you guys to look at using. And it's really quite simple. Um, you can do it this way. There's, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. Easiest way is to create a gray layer. So mid-tone gray layer. I'm going to bring that right up to the top, so it's over the top, and then add a filter, noise, add noise. So you, you're adding grain, and I can't see the alert because it's not bringing it. I've got this, I, I mentioned it last time, I've got this weird thing where my alerts go to the back when I'm streaming. Right, yeah. <laughs> so I might just press return. There it is. It is. Yeah found it <laughs> so you can add noise uh, and yeah something in between one or two it, it depends on the resolution of your image as to how much noise you would use so that at, it's probably too hard for you to see so I'm going to turn it up so you can see it right uh, that's what the noise is doing but yeah I'd have it sort of sit somewhere in maybe four at the most um, so it's like a super right. subtle kind of thing Yes, yes. And then what you do is either overlay if you want it a bit bit stronger or soft light if you want it a bit more subtle. Um, by adding noise, uh, it's hard to see on a video screen, but what it does, again, it brings everything together, particularly if you've shot elements at different ISOs. So um, I don't tend to do too much adjusting to the noise until right at the end. If something's really noisy and obviously noisy, if an element's noisy and, and the cats were noisier than the other elements because the chicken was photographed outside, the dog was photographed in the studio, the cats were photographed in a darker environment without extra lighting, so they had a bit more noise to them. So I did reduce the noise in Lightroom before I brought them in just so it wasn't as obvious. But adding the noise at the end really brings things together. So that is a good little thing to remember that's, when you bring that's a, together. That's a great tip. Yeah, that's, that's super great. And if you don't have photographs of clouds, you could – I'm sure you could go online and find some oh, and yeah. use Adobe stock for them as well, um, which yeah, is always yeah. an option. Um, that's so interesting that like so many of the animals were shot in completely different environments and, you mm. know, have to have, obviously it comes with experience, but it's really interesting, okay. like knowing where they were shot and understanding what you might need to do in Lightroom to, to the noise and, and everything like that. Um, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. 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 So the, even the, just one thing too, with the animals, um, that is a side note, it's more of a compositional side sort of thing. You'll notice too, that the smaller animal is closer to the front. So what I really wanted to do with the layout of this was to make sure that all the animals had their place, that they all, um, were highlighted. And so that meant bringing, you know, putting the dog further back. So it's, relevant to the size of the chicken as well so mm. thinking through your composition when you're compositing is really important too yeah um okay so that we've done the cloud overlay we've done the noise um the blend for edges it said so the other ones i'm taking you through atmosphere with a brush or also with an overlay and soft light blur blending i'm going to turn the noise and grain off as I said, I do that at the end. What happens with some of these other adjustments that I make is they um, they work on all of the layers. Uh, so they'll pick up the noise. So I'm turning this noise layer off. I'll leave it there and I'll turn it back on at the end. Um, we're going to go into blend for edges. And this is a really a trick that I use quite often to blend an animal into its background. Mm. You could spend forever trying to get the fine hairs, you know, extracted. Or you can do this and uh, kind of trick people at the end. So if I turn on the finishing touches so you can see what it would have looked like, it's just taking its time. Oh, yeah, you can see it on there. Right, My yeah. It took longer to come up. So there's like this fur thing going on, um, little bits of fur. Uh, mm -hmm. blending with the background. 
So that's our actual fur. I'll turn that off. What it is right. is yeah. the okay. smudge brush. Yeah. So this is all t way too soft. Um, and so I need to blend it. So what I'll do at the end, I'll use a blank layer. So it's a blank layer. It's not actually affecting the overall image. And I'll have it clicked on s sample all layers pressure sensitive. So the harder I press the pen down, the, the, the bigger that line is. And if I just, I'm just smudging, like I'm just running the pen. Um, I probably could change this so you can see what I'm doing on the tablet. Um, so I'm just doing this. Could you, oh no, right. I'm blocking it. <laughs> That's worse. <laughs> Mike was <laughs> Mike was right in the camera. Okay, there we go. There we go. I'll uh, I'll narrate. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. And so obviously, like pressure sensitivity yeah. is something you'll need. You'll need a a, um, a device, yeah, a tablet of some kind, like a pen of some kind, and a screen to jump yeah. on. But that's that's so great. Like I can imagine me sitting there thinking, you know, to, you know, trying to I don't know, getting in there with a lasso to the f first time or something like that. And then yeah. taking that out and then maybe trying to come in with like different levels of blur or different, you know, different levels of tolerance yes. with, you know, magic wand or something like that. Or, but this is really great. Mm -hmm. You can just very mm -hmm. quickly kind of come through. You're actually like painting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one good thing about it though, just uh, cause you did say painting, this method is completely allowed when you're entering photographic awards, when you have to use everything that is photographic um, that you've taken the photo of because what you're doing is you're actually smudging your own pixels. So just, Right. Okay. Just I like up. that technicality <laughs> um, it's part of the rules. That's that's great. Makes sense. Yeah. So I'm yeah. guessing the it's rules are something like everything within the photo must be from a photo you have taken or something. Correct. Um, and yes. so it's like, hey, yeah. that's those are my pixels. That's the photo. I'm just yeah. moving them. <laughs> Exactly, because the other way, if you did it with a brush and you just kind of used white, uh, you, that's technically not allowed. Right. Okay, <laughs> cool. The difference. Good to know. Um, but the good thing about this is that it's pulling in from a colour that you're, you know, you might go to a darker section and then it goes dark fur and so on. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily leave it like that. Um, I would create a mask and I would then soften it. So I'd use black to, you know, and I'd, Use a soft brush, so a much softer brush. Um, turn the flow down and just cut off the really extended bits as well. And then I would play with the opacity. So you, until it's just this subtle kind of fur rather than being a, a very, very obvious um, drawn in fur. So, mm. yeah, that, that's, that's something that works um, yeah, for all of the different animals that I would have done on the edges. Um, one other thing that on some of the edges, so if we go over to the chicken, so here, I'd need to do it on here. Um, but you can also use the healing brush for some sections. So if I go a new, new blank layer, the healing brush on edges can be a real kind of quick fix. And you can actually use that same technique. So oh. it's it's diff, It's not smudging it as such. It's just kind of, well, obviously it's using AI to try and work out what should be there and what shouldn't. Um, so it can help blend areas that don't quite look right. And again, and you did this you're on a, all layers. Oh, yeah, go on. Yes. A whole, a whole new layer, a whole new blank layer. We're about to talk about the exact same thing. Yeah, I think it's like <laughs> such a key thing because just how quickly you created a new layer and, if, you know, I can imagine me doing that and then going, why, you know, I can't yeah. do anything. There's no yeah. pixels. But that yeah. up, right up the top, so if anyone missed it, yeah. um, sample um, yeah. all layers is is what you want to pick. Um, oh, beautiful. We've even got the zoom in there. That's great. <laughs> yeah, sample all layers um, is the star of the show here. That's great. Is there a particular brush? That you're using or you're just using like yeah a... so that well that's the healing brush um just a round brush so just you a round brush turn yeah. your hardness down yep um but yeah it's just just a round brush there so yeah it it were it's really nice you can just have sometimes you can have these really annoying edges and when you've got so many layers mm. it can be 
frustrating to try and even find the layer that you're working with. So that's why some of this final fixing I do at the end. Now, if you do it halfway through, you're going to have problems because that layer, if you put something on top of it, you know, you can either cover it up or it's going to, you might put an adjustment above or below it. And, you know, if you put a levels adjustment below this particular layer, I'm just going to turn it down so it's darker. It does, it shows it up so it doesn't blend. So that's why you leave it right to the end mm. to do something like that. Yeah. So, Very cool. Um, we do have a question which we'll, we'll, we'll yes. just throw in while we're talking about kind of, um, you're talking about the AI, like the machine learning, kind of trying to figure things out. Um, so yeah. question in chat, um, how might neural slash AI features play a part in your workflow? Have you experimented much with them? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I have experimented with them. Actually, one of the ones I really love is um, the landscape and changing the landscape to a different season. Right. Uh, I don't know if any of you have tried that. For Christmas Wish, we're going to the hospitals and we take photos of the sick children and we put them into magical Christmas scenes to create a scene, you know, and, and obviously in Melbourne there's not much snow. So to be able to photograph something and then make it look like it's a snowy scene that is mm. very, very cool. Works well in some images, not so well in others. It's a bit of a trial and error, but yeah, there was it, it worked really well. The other thing that I've used a bit of is the depth um, depth map uh, filter, so that it, it picks up if you. And we talked about it a little bit last session. If I've photographed everything in focus from front to back with a uh, narrow aperture then I might want to add blur so you can use the depth map feature in the neural filters for it to figure out, well, this, this is the front of the image, so this should be sharp. This is You can choose where your focal point is, so we're actually putting someone, and then it can blur out the background. So that's a really, really helpful one as well. Mm, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next one, and keep jumping in with the questions as they come to, and I can always go back. Um, atmospheric brush. So there's two ways that I, I always add atmosphere. If I go back down, you're going to see if I turn it on, there's a heap of atmosphere that has been added to this uh, right. that is not there in the sort of this version of it. And there's, there's a few ways that you can do it. So the first way actually is using similarly like the textures. I've photographed all of these different atmospheric elements. Now the way I've photographed this one is rain. It's just a spray bottle. I'll pull it in so you can see it. Lights in the studio, a spray bottle and yeah, backlighting it and then photographing it. So it's created all this sort of splatter of rain. Um, I use that if I want to kind of add that, that water effect or that rain effect. And if I change that to soft light or overlay or, um, you know, screen mode uh, as well, that it will look different. Lighten is another one. So they all, they all look different, color dodge. But if I add that to a scene that needs rain and I pull that down, that works really, really well. Or I can just then mask in where I want some atmosphere as well. So if I only want that effect somewhere in the image, like at the back, I'm going to invert this mask. I'm going to use a brush. I'm going to turn, make that brush bigger and just show you. So you can just sort of have it right. where you want it. So it's, um, again, you're using a photograph that you've taken to bring in some atmosphere. What I will also show you with this one here is you can, you know, rain, usually when you have rain, the droplets are on an angle and they're longer. They're not frozen like this. Now you could photograph like that with a slower shutter speed or you can use a filter and you can go blur, motion blur, Oh, I love motion blur. This is so great. Yeah. Doesn't come out very often, but um, oh. <laughs> I love seeing <laughs> motion blur. Yeah, it do, it's great. So hang on, I'll do that again. So it's filter, blur, motion blur. There we go. So you can do motion blur. You can do different angles. So you can create that kind of rain effect. Mm. And in the snail one that you saw last time, last session, I did that. Um, the slimy so yeah. snails. 
<laughs> I don't know why that stuck in my head so much, like just how like how slimy they were. Um, they, yeah. <laughs> they needed to be in the rain. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so atmosphere atmosphere overlays are one way. But the other way that I could add atmosphere is using a brush. Now, the correct awards-friendly way of this is to create a blending mode. You can do this um, painting with white or painting with a brush, but again, you're adding pixels. So I create a levels adjustment layer and I change the levels to, so you can't see that. I'm going to bring that up here actually. If that helps you then Flynn oh, to stay perfect. down the bottom corner. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so I create the levels to the to what I envision I want my atmosphere to look like in terms of color and tone. So you can also, you know, maybe add a bit of warmth to it, and whatever you want to do. You can make that a uh, use a blending mode to change how that looks. So you can make that like screen mode, for example. So you prepare your overlay and then you use you invert it. So command I or control I on a PC, and then a brush that I've created from the atmosphere that I've photographed. So I've got a bunch of different brushes here. Let's say this dusty one, make it a bit bigger. So this is literally created from those other photos that I showed you before that are in my collection. Um, so now I can just use the brush I could stamp with the brush to make it bigger and I'll turn that flow up so you can see. So you can mm. change the brush so that it doesn't always go in the same direction as well. So so many options with brushes. Um, so for example, angle jitter, you could just have it so it continually changes. So every time I stamp, it moves. Or you can also have it so that the pen tilt and if I change back to the other mic, the other one, oh, I'm going to make sure you can see <laughs> I'll narrate. So you're going back to your other, yeah, the other scene. Yes. Um, and I assume this is going to tilt as you, as you tilt your yeah. pen. So I don't know if, um, actually, if I change my camera over here to the... No, that's not going to work. I was I was going to put it up on screen, but you you get the idea. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. If you if you don't chat <laughs> if you don't chat, let us know. But yeah, so you, there's just a setting yeah. in there so it can tilt. And I've seen I think there's yeah. some illustrators that kind of keep that on as well. Like some people will keep that setting yep. on a, a lot of the time yeah. um, to give that kind of natural um, natural kind of feeling. Um, so if you didn't yeah. know that that existed, now you do. Yeah, that's right. I'll bring that mic back so you can hear me properly. Oh, perfect. There we go. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I have that set for most of my brushes because it's um, also when you're masking in or using a hairbrush to cut in, different things like that, it's really, really helpful. Uh, so atmosphere, I, I tend to do more than one layer. Like it's not going to be one layer and I'm done. Sometimes, you know, you build up the background and you might do a little more subtle work on the, on the foreground. Um, and different opacities and everything until it looks like the original here. It's got more atmosphere in that background. And I, I worked on the background, you know, further down in the layers panel. So it goes behind all of these different um, elements mm. and then a little in the front as well. So, um, yeah, and then some more with the light to create a bit more of a light ray sort of situation. So you have some sort of adjustment layers that are just for the background, some that are over everything yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. exactly. Yeah. How many layers? I know this is the cut down version because we're focusing oh, on yeah. just what we're focusing on. I've got to ask, how many layers would something like this um, end up having in Paul Park? <laughs> hundreds. I, I, hundreds. I don't yeah. know. It's so hard because you get so many adjustments on individual layers as well so each of the you know the animals will have different adjustments to shade and to lighten and to blend and to bring them all together yeah there's there's usually hundreds it's just sort of a process of um, working through and then grouping them together so trying to keep each part grouped so you're not you're not losing layers um, making them even smart objects so they're all in one and then continuing the process 
yeah 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 that's great. Um, there was one more question as well, um, just as we're mm -hmm. talking about layers. What's your most yeah. commonly used layer adjustment and is it multiply? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the layer adjustment, the adjustment that I put on a lot of my layers is levels adjustment. So that's right. to make things darker and lighter. Um, I, yeah, there's, I, I don't know, I use overlay and um, so in the blending modes, I use overlay and soft light probably the most, but also multiply, to multiply makes things darker. So, yeah, there's, uh, I don't know, there, there's no, probably not one specific one. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now if I turn this off, the next thing, so we've gone through atmosphere. Now the soft light blur blending, I don't even really have a proper name for this. I just call it that for now. Um, call it whatever you want. But this process is something that I do quite right at the end that um, helps to blend everything together. I'm just going to change my brush so I'm not on that one. Okay. Um, and I'll let you and chat know as well. We've got about four minutes left today. Okay. So it's gone, it's gone cool. quick. <laughs> it has gone quick, but we are nearly at the finish line. Um, so what I would do at this point is create a... Um, to select a section of this scene, the lighter parts of the scene. So I go into channels and choose one of the channels. Blue might work well, maybe green. I like, it, it depends what I want pulled out. What will be selected with this method are the lighter areas, more so than the darker areas. I create a, this is, this one might need, you might need to rewatch a few times people because there's several steps to it, but I create a selection using the channel and that's selecting, as I said, more so the lighter areas. Mm. Go back to the RGB. So now I've got my selection and then I'll do this so you can visually see. Edit, copy, merged will copy the bits that are selected. Right. On, off, from all the layers because it's copy merge, not just copy. Okay. And then I'm doing this again. You can use your shortcuts, but paste. Now, I think that went into that layer. I am going to double check that it did because uh, it doesn't look like it did. All right. I'll try that again. Mm -hmm. Edit, paste. I think I know why. That's I'll I'll do it. Again. Hang on. There we go. There we That's go. There. I saw okay. It. <laughs> <laughs> I know why it didn't? Anyway, who knows? There it is. So that is now. There's certain areas that it's that it's copied. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is blur them. So what I'm blurring here are not darker areas. It's just those lighter areas. Right. Quite substantially, sort of this hazy Vaseline type on your lens kind of look uh, at this point. So about 30, press OK. Now, I could change that to soft light mode now. That doesn't look too bad. It's a little bit over the top. So then I play with the opacity. If it's looking too um, vibrant, if the colors are too popping too much I would then change that layer just to um, black and white so there we go so then it's got the pop but not the not too much color so it's right. not changing the color um, now if I make that overlay mode it might be more obvious so that's full on, but then again, pulling that back, adding the noise afterwards, just once once everything builds up, then it, it all looks beautiful. So turn that off, turn that off, turn that off. And there we go. <laughs> great. That's great. That's great timing because we are actually out of time. That was really cool. Um, thank you so much, Karen, um, for everything today and Tuesday. If you guys caught today, but you missed on missed out on Tuesday, go and check it out. Um, it was really great. Photographed miniatures, lots of cameras. Again, um, a full production um, that Karen has put on for us. It's been fantastic. So go and check that out. Thank you. I have had so much fun. Thanks everyone for joining.
It's been great. And um, we'll be back uh, next week on Adobe Live. We're going to continue our, um, you know, focus on uh, photography and editing. Um, we'll be doing some more Photoshop stuff with um, Ramesh Hari Krishnasamy um, on uh, Tuesday next week. So until then, thank you all for watching. And Karen, again, thank you so much for sharing everything with us uh, this week. Thank you very much, Flynn. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you next time.